This is part of a series of lectures on elliptic functions. I will start by giving a very quick mm. review of what was in the previous lecture. We were talking about the Weierstrass elliptic function, P of Z. So this is elliptic, which means it's periodic for lambda in some um, lattice um, L, which is a subset of the complex numbers. There's a double pole um, at z equals zero, um, and all elliptic functions can be written as polynomials in the elliptic modular function and its derivative. Um, what I'm going to talk about this lecture is um, variations on the, 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 the um, um, a group law associated to it. So we've got this um, group C modulo the lattice, and we can think of um, Weierstrass's function as being a function on this lattice, taking values in, in C union infinity. Um, this is a group, um, uh, since L is isomorphic to the sum of two copies of Z, and C is the sum of two copies of R, this is just isomorphic to product of two copies of the circle group, so its structure is very easy to see. Um, and what we want to do is to describe this group structure in terms of the values of p. In other words, we would like to know what is p of z1 plus z2. If we're given p of z1 and p of z2. So this is a sort of analog of the addition formula for sine or cosine. You know sine of z1 plus z2 is sine of z1 times cosine of z2 plus something else and so on. Um, well um, we'd also like to know what it does to the derivatives so we recall that if we've got um, we've got a map from C modulo L to the um, projective plane um, which takes a point Z to um, P of Z P prime of Z at least as Z is not in L. If C is in L, it takes a point of L to the point at infinity. And so, so, so this is just a point of C squared, which is contained in the projective plane. Now, I'm just writing the affine coordinates because these are a bit easier to, to think about. Um, and if we call these points X and Y, then we recall that the differential equation satisfied by P says that Y squared is equal to 4X cubed minus g2 x minus g3 for suitable constants g2 and g3 and um, <coughs> this is uh, an example of an elliptic curve <coughs> so it will be a curve looking maybe something like this cubic curve in p2 and cubic curves in p2 a very famous group law on them where three numbers lie on a line if and only if their sum is zero. So if these are the points a, b and c, then a plus b plus c equals naught in the in the group if a, b and c are collinear. This means this doesn't mean their sum as vectors, it means their sum in the group law on this curve. And the, um, the point at infinity is the zero of um, the group. Um, so, um, so we've got a map between two groups. We've got a map from the group C modulo L to this cubic curve. And obviously we would like this map to be a, a, a homomorphism or an isomorphism of groups. Um, so we would like to check that it is indeed. So let's first of all recall what it means for three points to be collinear. So <clears throat> if we've got three points x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, these are collinear if the following determinant vanishes. So we take x1, y1, 1, x2, y2, 1, x3, y3, 1. And if this is the, this being zero corresponds to the three points being collinear. Um, and we want xi to be 
P of Z I and Y I to be P of P prime of Z I. So what we should do is we should look at the following determinant. We take P of Z1, P prime of Z1, 1, P of Z2, P prime of Z2, 1, P of Z3, P prime of Z3, 1. And we want to know what is this determinant, or at least we want to know what are its zeros. Um, well, this determinant probably vaguely reminds you of the Vandermond determinant. You remember the Vandermond determinant looks like 1 x x squared, 1 y y squared, 1 z z squared. And of course, you could put in more variables and higher powers if you wanted. And you remember this is easy to evaluate because it's um, divisible by x minus y because it vanishes if x is y because the first two rows are equal. And it's divisible by x minus c and it's divisible by y minus c and both sides are degree three so so this determinant is plus or minus this expression here and we can do the same trick for this so we notice that this is zero if um, z1 equals z2 or z1 equals z3 or z2 equals z3 and we would like to know, does it have any other zeros? It turns out that it does. So if we look at this determinant, we think of this as a, a function of just z1. And you see, we found um, two zeros of z1. So as a function of z1, it has a pole of order 3 at 0. Um, if you expand it out. Um, and um, so how many zeros does it have? Well, if you've got an elliptic function, the number of zeros is equal to the number of poles that's in a fundamental domain. And the reason for this is that if you take a fundamental domain, so here's zero and omega one, omega two, and here's omega one plus omega two, um, then you can find the number of zeros of a function f just by integrating the function f of prime of z over f of z dz. So this is equal to the number of zeros minus the number of poles. True for any um, holomorphic, meromorphic function that you're 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 um, looking at in, in, inside some contour. Um, and um, um, if f is elliptic, this is zero. And that's because the integral along the bottom and the integral along the top cancel out with each other by periodicity. And similarly, the integral along the left and the right cancel out by periodicity. So our, our function f of z1 has um, three poles, or rather a pole of order three, um, zero, zero, and zero, and it's got two zeros at z1 and z2. And if you look at this, you see there's a missing zero. There should be three zeros, and we've only found two of them, so where's the other one? Um, well, there's an easy way to find out. Um, we, we said the um, number of zeros is equal to the number of poles. There's, there, there's another um, nice result which says that the sum of the zeros is equal to the sum of the poles modulo the lattice L. So if the zeros are z1, z2 and so on, then z1 plus z2 plus cn is equal to p1 plus p2 plus pn plus something in L, where, where the zeros are at these points and the poles are at these points. And to see this, all we do is we take 1 over 2 pi i times the integral of z f prime of z over f of z dz. And again, we integrate over a fundamental domain. And um, this thing here has a, has a pole of order 1 
at zeros with so a pole of residue one at the zeros and more generally a pole of residue n at a zero of order n so so the sum of the zeros minus the sum of the poles is just this expression here so this is the sum of the zeros minus the sum of the poles well in this case the integrals over the top and the bottom don't quite cancel out um, this expression here is um, d by dz of log of f of z um, and um, 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 so, so, so log of f of z can change by um, 2 pi i n under um, elements of the lattice L. Um, and if you work this out, it means the top and the bottom integral don't quite cancel out. Um, um, what happens is you get omega 1 times some integer n and similarly the left and the right don't quite cancel out you get omega 2 times some integer so this integral turns out to be omega 1 plus times an integer plus omega 2 times an integer which is some element of l so so that proves this identity here now let's apply this to our function f so so you remember the poles are 0 0 and 0 and the zeros were z 2 z3 and a mystery zero um, well we've seen that zero plus zero plus zero is equal to z2 plus z3 plus this mystery zero so this identifies the mystery zero it's equal to minus c2 minus c3 modulo the lattice l so we've we've identified um, the missing zero so um our determinant, um, let me just go back since I don't want to write out this determinant again, has a third zero. It's also zero if C1 plus C2 plus C3 is equal to zero. And these should all be mod L, of course. So we found the three, um, the three zeros of this as a function of Z. Um, so um, uh, now if we um, um, compare this with um, the uh, um, cubic curve, we see that the, the, the PZ1, PZ1 prime, um, Pz2, Pz2 prime, and Pz3, Pz3 prime are collinear. If um, if zi equals zj mod l, or z1 plus c2 plus c3 um, uh, is zero. Mod, modulo the lattice L. Um, so these being collinear is the group law on the elliptic curve and these summing to zero gives you the group law on C modulo, modulo L. So the group law on C modulo L corresponds to the group law on the elliptic curve but by, by, by this map taking, taking Z to P of Z, P prime of Z. Um, I'll... Um, um, have a sort of exercise. You can generalize this. So, so, um, so here's an exercise. Let's find the zeros of the following determinant. Let's take p of z1, p prime of z1, p prime of p double prime of z1, one, and then I'm going to take p of z2. And I'm not going to write all these out. P of z3, P of z4. Um, and um, previously we had a map from C modulo L to um, a cubic curve in the plane. Well, if we take z to P of z1, P prime of z1, P 
e double prime of z1 1 this gives a map from c modulo l to um, a curve in three-dimensional projective space um, and for the elliptic curve and um, we saw that three points added up to zero if and only if they lie in a line for this curve um, um, four points have some zero um, if and only if they lie on a plane in P3. So you can prove all these by sort of imitating the proof I gave for the, for the curve in the plane. Um, these are actually um, two special cases of a whole sequence of projective embeddings of our elliptic curve. So we, we can take a number n to be 1 or n equals 2 or n equals 3 or n equals 4 and so on. And for n equals 1, I'm going to map the point z to the point 1 in P0. So this is not terribly exciting. It's just mapping C modulo L to a single point. For n equals 2, I can map z to the point 1 P of z um, in one dimensional projective space. Um, of course, this is sometimes infinite, so you have to sort of renormalize it a bit. Um, and this maps C modulo L to P1, and it, it's it's a almost a double cover. Um, it's a two to one map, except at four points. There, there, there are four points where P has derivative zero, and you, you get um, the inverse image of a point in P1 is only one point here. So, so here we get C modulo L maps to a point. Uh, for n equals 3, we map Z to 1 P of Z P prime of Z. And here we're mapping C over L to a cubic in P2. And the next one we map Z to 1 P of z and so on up to P double prime of z. And this maps c over l to a degree 4 in P3. And it continues like this. So you can map it to a degree 5 curve in P4 and so on. And this gives you a whole sequence of embeddings of c modulo l into various projective spaces and for all of them you can describe the group law by saying all the points lie on some hyperplane. Um, if you've done algebraic geometry you may recognize these as being the projective embeddings associated with various powers of a certain line bundle. There's something called a line bundle on an elliptic curve and its first, second, third and fourth powers um, give you uh, these four embeddings. Um, um, the reason why we, we usually use the case n equals 3 is n equals 1 and 2 are too small because the, the, the curve isn't isomorphic to its image. And n equals 4 is just more complicated than the case n equals 3 because, uh, you know, dealing with a curve in P2 is obviously a lot easier than dealing with a more complicated curve in P3. So that's why everybody uses... Um, this embedding of C over L as a cubic in P3. It's the simplest case that, that gives you an embedding. Um, well, we've um, got a bit of a problem. We found an addition formula for um, which relates P of Z1 plus C2 to P of Z1 and P of Z2, but it doesn't quite because um, if you look at the determinant we had, it's also got the derivative of Z1 and Z2. And we can eliminate this because you remember there's a differential equation relating this. So, so what we really want to do is to write, have an, have an explicit expression for just P of Z1 and Z2 in terms of P of Z1, um, P of Z2 and their derivatives. And I'll show you how to um, extract that from from the, 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 the previous result. Um, the problem is really the following. It's really a geometric problem that, that um, P 
purely algebraic problem. Um, suppose x1, y1, x2, y2, and x3, y3 lie on a line and on a cubic y squared equals 4x cubed minus g2x minus g3. And the problem is find x3 in terms of x1 and x2. In other words, we want to describe the group law on the cubic um, explicitly. Um, and we're going to do this as follows. Um, um, we notice that x1, x2 and x3 are roots of a certain cubic equation. I'm going to write down a bit of this equation. Well, it's going to be 4x cubed minus y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 squared times um, x um, x uh, so x squared um, plus something times x that I don't care about plus something that I don't care about. So um, where does this factor come from here? Well, well what you do is you use the fact that um, they lie on a line which is given by 1x1y1, 1 1y2y2, 1 1 1x3y3 1 1 equals 0. And if you write this out, it says x1y2 minus x2y1 minus y2 minus y1 x3 plus x2 minus x1 and y3 equals 0. And this says that y3 is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 x3 plus some constant that I don't care about. Now the cubic equation says that 4x cubed minus um, y squared minus something or other in x and and a constant term is equal to zero. So um, if you notice y is given by this expression here. So y squared is really that this expression here. And I don't care about the linear and the constant term. Um, all I need to know is that if you've got a cubic equation, then the sum of the roots of the equation is the, is the term coefficient of x squared divided by the coefficient of x cubed. So we find x1 plus x2 plus x3 is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 squared divided by 4. And um, this gives us the answer. So this tells us what x3 is in terms of y2, y1, x1 and x, x2 and x1. And if we recall that xi is equal to p of zi and yi is equal to p dash of zi and expand this out, we just find that um, p of z1 plus z2 is equal to a quarter of uh, p prime of z2 minus p prime of z1 over p of z2 minus p of z1 all squared minus p of z1 minus p of z2. So this gives us the addition formula for the Weierstrass p function. As you see, it's really just the um, group law for a cubic curve in a slightly disguised form. Um, we can also put z1 equals z2 and get the duplication formula for the Weierstrass p function. So p of z times 2 is equal to a quarter of p double prime z squared over p prime of z squared minus 2 p of z. You see, um, now if z1 is equal to z2, then this vanishes and this vanishes. So you have to use Dropatel's rule to figure out what this quotient is, which means you take another derivative of p. So um, 
This is the duplication formula for the Weierstrass p function, which is the sort of analog of the duplication formula for, for sine and cosine. Um, now, now I'm going to give an example of how to use this. So an elliptic curve is isomorphic as a group to S1 times S1. So it is n squared points um, z with nz equals zero. Um, so these are the points of order n and they form a little group. And um, number theorists are very interested in these points because they, they, they give Galois representations. So the idea is if you've got a cubic curve with um, coefficients in the rationals, so say y squared equals 4x cubed minus g2x minus g3, if g2 um, and g3 are rational, um, then if you look at the points of order n, that these have algebraic coefficients. And these coefficients generate um, extensions of the rationals. And um, you can, using, um, using, using the elliptic curve gives you very good control over these extensions. They give you nice Galois extensions with the nice Galois groups. So number theorists wish to know what are the points of order n. So we now have the problem. Let's find the points of order n on this curve. Um, another way of doing this is to find an elliptic function vanishing on the non-zero points of order n. Um, we can't have it vanishing on all the points of order n and nowhere else because the number of poles has to be equal to the number of zeros. So what we're going to do is to put a big pole at zero and zeros at all the other points of order n. So um, let's do this for n equals 2 and n equals 3. Well, n equals 2 is easy. All we do is we look at the derivative of p and we notice this vanishes at the points of order 2. We notice there are three points of order 2. If I draw a fundamental domain, 0, omega 1, omega 2 there, then the points of order 2 are just these three points here. So, so, so these are the three points of order 2. Um, and <coughs> um, um, so these points will be omega 1 over 2, omega 2 over 2, and omega 1 plus omega 2 over 2. And by the way, these, these points of order 2 turn up so often that um, a common convention is to call the periods 2 omega 1 and 2 omega 2. So these points of order 2 are sometimes written as omega 1, omega 2, and omega 1 plus omega 2. Well, what we notice is that P of Z plus omega 1 over 2 is still even, so its derivative vanishes at zero. Um, so what we're doing is using the fact that if you've if you've got a an even periodic function um, with period omega, so suppose um, I've got some sort of periodic function. I don't know what it might be. It might look something like this. You notice the derivative is always going to be zero at these half periods. And that's what just what's going on here. The, the p is an even periodic function, so its derivative automatically vanishes at all the half periods. Um, well, p prime of z has order three because it's got a pole of order three. So it has um, a pole of order three at zero and zeros at the points of order two. That's, I'm using the word order in two different ways. It's got zeros of order one at the points of the elliptic curve of order two. 
So n equals 2 is easy. Now let's try n equals 3. And this time we've got eight non-zero points of order 3. So if you draw a picture, um, here's the fundamental domain, 0, omega 1, omega 2. And there will be um, nine points of order 1 or 3 sort of uh, living on a little lattice like that um, and we're trying to find an elliptic function that has um, zeros of order one here but um, here it has a pole order eight because there are, there are eight zeros um, <clears throat> Um, now, um, you notice that if 3z is in the lattice L, then p of z is equal to p of 2z, um, because 2z um, is congruent to minus c, and p is even, so p of z is equal to p of minus c. So um, now we can... Um, recall that we had um, a duplication formula so this is just a quarter of p double prime of z squared over p uh, prime of z squared minus two times p of z um, so uh, this gives us um, the points of order three we, we, we just want 3p of z minus a quarter of p prime of z squared. So p double prime of z squared over p prime of z squared. So this should be equal to zero. Well, that um, this isn't quite the right answer because um, a p prime of z also vanishes at points of order two. So, so, so this is giving us a few extra poles that we don't really want. And um, well, what, what we can do is we can now just multiply it by the square of this, and we may as well get rid of the four as well. So we get 12 P of Z times P prime of Z squared minus P double prime of Z squared vanishes at the points of order three and if you look at this you see this um, has a pole of order eight at the zero so we found all the zeros because we found eight zeros and it only has eight zeros so this is the function we want that um, um, vanishes um, at the points of order three um, obviously, you can continue this for other values of n. So for n greater than 3, we can do something similar. And we can find a formula for p of nz and find functions vanishing at the n squared points of order n. However, it's pretty obvious that for n bigger than 3, the algebra is going to get more and more complicated. And you're probably going to want a computer algebra system to go much further than this. Um, so um, this, this sort of illustrates that there are enormous numbers of algebraic identities involving the Weierstrass function. In fact, um, books will sometimes contain pages and pages of them. I, I've got a few examples here from Whitaker and Watson. You see here are some um, um, complicated looking identities mm -hmm. between the Weierstrass function. And there are you know, these go on for several pages, and some of them are pretty scary. I mean, I was, I was looking at um, this one here. Let me just magnify it so you can see it. Okay, so um, this one here, I, I honestly have no idea how to prove it or what it's good for. Um, the really scary thing about this identity is, um, this apparently was a undergraduate mathematics exam question back in 1897 so so um 
in, a, in back in 19, 1897, undergrads were expected to do things that I have no idea how to do. Um, actually, I suspect most of the undergraduates at that time couldn't do it either. But anyway, um, OK, so. Um, uh, next lecture will probably be on the Jacobi elliptic functions. Mm -hmm.